talking about big data, artificial intelligence, and ethics, we surely also have to talk about persuasive technology in the attention economy because uh, they provide a very good example of what can go ethically wrong in the digital realm. What these technologies basically are is they are extensions of our mind. All right, the so same as previous industrial revolution built uh, steam extensions, steam technology extensions of our muscles. These technologies provide extensions of our mind, of our mind function, thinking and, uh, and feeling uh, among others. So uh, if you're like me, for example, you probably outsource some of your memory functions to your, to your reminder on your phone. Uh, and this is where these technologies dog on. They dog onto your thoughts, on your emotions, and then they sometimes drag them all over the internet for everybody else to see. So we have to talk about how this is happening and, and for what reason this is happening. Uh, we will talk about also about the extent that this is already happening in our society today. And last but not least, about some exit strategies. So what? So, so, so what can we do about this now? We usually, when we create a new technology uh, and we are in the beginning of a technological revolution, we tend to focus on the upsides of the strength, the human strength, and then we see the technologies and how it can complement these, these human strength. Uh, for example, at the beginning of the internet, we were convinced it's a tool for democracy, for freedom, to spread joy and likes. You know, the like button was intended to spread a lot of, of joy and, and likes. It even says, it says it really, giving some positive feedback to, to people. And if we were thinking about the downsides, we never thought that actually you could also flip that around, right? The technology can be used to destroy democracy. It can curb our freedom. It can manipulate us. It can dictate us and it can lead to a law, to depression. Uh, 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 so totally the opposite of what we were thinking about before. Now, if you were thinking about some downsides, eventually you were thinking, well, it could be that these technologies then overcome the best of our strength. So we gave this event a name. It's called the technological singularity. But that was pretty far out. And if, if technology came close to actually overtaking our mind, overtaking our intelligence, we were always looking for a new solution. For example, the last battle of humanity. That's how it was called in the late 90s, uh, the, the, the chess game of Kasparov against Deep Blue from IBM. We sent our best, our best chess player we sent to fight this machine in something uh, that is really difficult, a good chess game. And well, he famously lost. Well, that was back, back in the late 90s. And then we said, well, OK, but machines, OK, maybe in chess, that's kind of like a quantitative math nerd thing. What about images. There's still the qualitative things. The machine cannot. How could a machine understand an image? Well, then in 2015, machines recognized images better than we could. But then we said, okay, so what else? Um, the human voice, the voice of a mother, the, the child recognizes this voice. The human, well, in 2016, the machines were better than human in recognizing voices, uh, human voices. And then we said, well, the human face. Right, the face, the human face is unique. We are evolutionary programmed too well, and then we programmed machines that actually well. And so we are in this race, and we are still in this race. It becomes more difficult to find aspects, but there certainly the machines cannot do everything human can, and and I'm also convinced of that. Let me state that very clearly. So uh, while the while the frontier is kind of like being pushed back, there is still this race ongoing, and and the best way we can do as Professor. John von Neumann always used to say, we just have to see what the machine does better and what we do better and then find ways to integrate and to work together with the machines. The same happened before when we divided the labor in, in the muscle work, right? We still, uh, we still can do some things better than the machines, uh, the muscle machines of the previous industrial revolutions. And the same happens now in the mind revolution, in the, uh, in the information communication revolution. Now, what we completely lost sight of while playing this game of to see what the machine can do and what we cannot do is we completely lost sight of the fact that in order to control us and get the best of us, the machines don't have to be better than the best of us. In order to get the best of us, they just have to be better than the worst in us. And they have to dominate our weaknesses. And by exploiting our weaknesses, they can actually dominate. 
the best in us. And we completely lost sight of that. So while the digital paradigm went on through these first two decades, and then during the third decade, we realized, whoa, third and fourth decade, we realized, whoa, there's, there's actually, well, it's controlling already our mind to some extent. So technological angst has then been rising in the in the 2010s uh, to the 2020s. This phenomena became more and more visible among people. Depression, addiction, um, fake news, uh, misinformation. And there are some also some documentaries. If you haven't seen this documentary, The Social Dilemma, I invite you to watch it. I mean, it's a it's a it's a movie. As an academic, I have a lot of things to say about this movie and how. But okay, for what's it's a movie? It's 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 informative. So I invite you to watch this one and see and learn a little bit more about the social dilemma, which has to do with the downsides of persuasive technology in our attention economy.